Today's episode is brought to you by the Vegas Beer Guys and the Sounds in Cinema podcast. Everything sequel contains explicit language. And why the fudge not, you melon farmer? The How Dare You Awards. Joining me, of course, is America's treasure, Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions. What's your last line for the series, Tom? I need to talk to the goblin. <laughs> All right. I don't think Warwick Davis I'll likes give you being that one. Ref- I don't think Warwick Davis likes being uh, referred to as that. I believe the term nope. is little people. <laughs> <laughs> give it to him, though. How good is he in that movie? Warwick Davis? Yeah. That's the reason why this isn't my least favorite movie, pretty much. Just him? No, no, but the combination of him and and John Hurt uh, is a big reason why this is slightly higher than than part one. Man, I'd like you to watch the first one just just for a little John Hurt. In fact, don't watch the whole movie. Get just get just just take in the scene of John Hurt in that first movie. I want to tell you, I am I'm dangerously close to watching that because I think I would prefer it to this fake ass version of a grown up film. <laughs> a genuine kids movie. I'm I'm more. It is more about kids. That. Yeah, it is more kids than any of the other movies. That first movie. Yeah. I I. You know, uh, uh, the, uh, I think initially, you know, when I was deciding whether or not I would uh, watch the Harry Potter movies, read the Harry Potter books, and we all know how that went. Um, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> we have like 107 my... episodes of you describing how you didn't and won't. Because I would have been, what, like in my late teens when it came out or something like that. And so I was probably, I was probably anti the idea that it was a, that, um, you know, I probably, I was probably being too cool for school, literally. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, you know, this is just a kid's story. But I'll tell you now, that's what attracts me to this more than anything else. <laughs> Is that it might just that somewhere in there there might be just a kid story that I can appreciate wholly on that level as a parent of a child. That is great. Now the idea of this kind of like you know shadowy uh, fake morality play, uh, you know Je- Jesus meets black magic. That's what puts me off at this point. <laughs> Fine. Whatever. <laughs> well, of course, ladies and, I love and gentlemen. John, and I love John Hurt. You do love John Hurt? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. He's beyond criticism, I think. Agreed. And he must, he's must he got to be because he was in Crystal Skull and I still love him. Right. <laughs> Not that I want to go down a rabbit hole, but when you see the Paramount logo turn into... A gopher. A gopher. A gopher hill with the CGI gopher coming out of it, that's when I went, uh oh. We're in fucking trouble. That's... <laughs> we're in fucking trouble. <laughs> but today, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. Speaking of CGI creatures, 2011. So they got to yeah. extend this franchise for one more year, Tom. Budget uh, budgets down a little bit, 125 million. Of course, 380. Did it so. do better or worse than Part One? It did better worldwide. This Damn movie it. is the only one I think in the series worldwide over a billion. 1.342 billion. And yeah, the the last movie in the USA, 296. This movie, 381. But I think part of that is, hey, this is the end. Apart from the play and the prequels. Right. 
<laughs> always be wary. If there's one thing we're going to have to learn, we're going to have to be wary of when a, a sequel franchise says it's the end. Yeah. Because it's almost never true. Right. I mean, you and I were just talking the other day. We were like, Richard Donner is 90 years old and he's going to do another fucking lethal weapon. Right. You know? Right. I mean, what, you know, the when they when the Friday the 13th movies actually put in the title that this is the end of the franchise and then proceed to make another movie a couple of years later. <laughs> right. You can't invest too much in this. Remember what we said? Forget it. <laughs> well, this movie uh, garnered three Oscar nominations, visual effects, uh, art direction, and makeup. Very well deserved. Right. So... make The makeup on the goblins is fabulous. And we have right. the exact opposite of that to compare it to in, in Troll 2. <laughs> which, say. which, as just a reminder, if no one heard that episode... <laughs> Features only goblins and no trolls. And no trolls. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny to me because, th- th- you know, that denotes that they were trying to capitalize on the great success of the first troll movie, apparently. Which, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Yeah. Um. So, listen. Here's a couple of fun facts for you. Oh. Daniel Radcliffe. He broke eight wands during the making of these. During the making of these films, he used to like to use them as drumsticks. He also had Uh, over a hundred and sixty pairs of glasses. Oh well, uh, you know we're both glasses wearers, and does that surprise you? I, I, I take care of my glasses. Oh, you do. I don't take care of mine at all. No. No, they. No, I, I, I lose them. I break them all the time. I, I, any kind of physical activity, it just. Uh, so I, I, I understand it from that perspective. However, using ones as drumsticks sounds like a bit of a dick. Dick move for sure. <laughs> Maybe he was still on the drink. So I, the jury's out on on his his onset behavior. <laughs> All right, now I list this as my last movie in the series. I believe this is the second to last for you. Wow. Right? So, wait, so (laughs) you're telling me I like this more than you do? Yeah. Holy shit. Now I want to be clear, Tom. I fucking love this movie. (laughs) However... Some movies got to be last in a, in a ranking, and for me, it's this one. Why? Well, I think it goes back to what we were saying in the last episode. And I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I can't help it as an avid fan of the books. No, that's what you're here to do. Otherwise, <laughs> right. otherwise, it would just be two people asking each other questions for which there are no answers. <laughs> <laughs> because for me, like I said in the last episode, I was so surprised that you got through like three quarters of the book for that movie. Yeah. And it left me wondering where this movie goes. Now, it goes to places like, look, I, I like almost everything in this movie. But really, this movie is five scenes max. Completely. You know, and that's it. I was so worried when everything wrapped up and there was still like half an hour to go. Right. I had that same feeling at like, the you know, and, and it's a direct comparison because it's, you know, a, a famous fantasy book series and a series of movies. And this move, these movies and books rip off Lord of the Rings horribly. Um, Says you. But, uh, which I don't even like. So I'm <laughs> pointing at. Um, but when you like the the last don't Lord let of the Stephen Rings Colbert movie, hear that. I know, I know, and and half the world apparently. <laughs> um, but when we got to that last quarter of what's the last one? Is it Return of the King? Mm-hmm. The last Lord of the Rings movie. It was like a good half hour to go, and uh, <laughs> I know and for you the story is over. <laughs> Well, the story is literally over. Uh, I'm like, what do they fill this last half an hour with? And their answer was, 
goodbyes. Literally just people saying goodbye for half an hour. So I was so worried that this was going to wind up the same way <laughs> of like, okay, what what is there left to do? I mean, in the in the book Return of the King, as I understand, um, there's a whole thing when they get back to the Shire uh, that, um, what's he called? Saruman, the wizard, mm-hmm. has fucked up the Shire. And so they have to deal with that. Um, oh, okay. Which meant that they decided they'd rather have 20 minutes of people saying goodbye than, than, than that bit of story. A scene involving Christopher Lee. <laughs> Thankfully, this movie, I don't think. I'm not a fan of the time jump, but I don't think it's as. Oh, that was one of my big questions for you. I don't think that's as bad a mis that's a yeah it's certainly i feel like cut it on without it it's in the book without, so if you leave it, it out without this people whole movie. will go ape shit <laughs> could have done without this whole movie to be honest but um <laughs> it didn't bother me as much as it did in lord of the rings i'm like no this is literally half an hour of people saying goodbye yeah nothing else after three movies of people walking is around is it that long are you talking about after voldemort dies no, I'm talking about uh, Lord of the Rings. No, but for this movie, you said there's like a half hour of movie after the end. I was just, I think, uh, like the big, after the big stand up, there's a good 20, 30 minutes, I think, right? I don't think I would have I said it's th- that long, but. I remember. Because you have everybody, you know, we're seeing some people that died, you know, that one of the Weasley t- twins dies. Harry walks off. They decide what to do with the Elder Wand. And then it's, mm. you know, then it's... I just remember be- being worried about how quickly things were wrapping up. Like, <laughs> almost, like, halfway... Th- oh, that's, yeah. But this movie's a lot shorter than the others. There is no argument for this to be a movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> You, well, that's why said, that's why it's at you the said bottom it's five for me. Scenes, this, it's full of highlights packages from recaps of the previous movie. You know, uh, showing things that have happened before in a different light. Packages, <laughs> flashbacks here and there. So, like, you know, I'm not complaining. In the first, yes, you are. Know. It's exactly what you're doing. That's what no, you. No, but what I'm not com- what you're what here for. Compla- what I'm not complaining about is taking the time. So, in the, the first sort of fifteen twenty minutes, this movie is basically Daniel Radcliffe is in an immersive theatre experience where he walks into rooms and talks to the best actors in Britain, <laughs> and then every time he goes in, one of them gives him a monologue. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm up for that. You mentioned that in one of our previous podcasts where he's just walking into a bunch of rooms. He he talks to two people. He talks to two people. It takes a long time. But one of them is John Hurt. The other is Warwick Davis. Right. They're finally letting Warwick Davis do some real acting. And he nails Fuck, it. Fuck, he's good. It's no coincidence that that this is the same year that he became the first little person actor to have his own sitcom. Mm-hmm. Life is short. Same year. Um, Life is Short came out in 2011. So, w- in whatever order this happened, you know, this is his year. And he's been through this franchise uh, from the big- from the very beginning with very little to do. He's earned this 100%. I agree completely. I think he is... The manner in which he is able to convey how cunning this character is and i mean uh, he also does the warwick davis thing of you notice when he's not playing two characters in a major franchise film Uh uh-huh right that's like it's weird when he doesn't play more than one character in a star wars movie (laughs) or in a harry potter movie so he's kind of really turned the tables on that uh, you know, he's it's it's that's just what he does. That's his thing. Uh, and he nails both characters brilliantly. Absolutely. Uh, but 
I'm glad they gave him, you know, they gave him his his day in court, his his scene to end all scenes. And then, you know, you you introduce John Hurt or reintroduce apparently John Hurt. Uh, you gotta let him do some. You know, you gotta let him have his monologue. Oh yeah. And they do. So all those choices are, are almost make up for the the previous movie where I had to watch inexperienced actors carry the movie. <laughs> now it's like very much saying like, here's your legacy cast and your British national treasures. Come spend some time with them in a room. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I like that. And I even like the fact that we recapped the previous movie just because it made it feel like a real sequel. We, you know, we had to have a multi-part movie before we did that, but okay. <laughs> Now, were you retroactively upset that this is all you get? From them? Yeah. Well, not so... I guess you have Warwick a little longer, but... Well, yeah, but it's quite... But uh, the fo- the focus is... Well, no, because then in the middle of the... This is, this is what I mean about, like, the, the, the act... The, the supporting cast always saving these movies for me. In the middle of the movie, you get... Maggie Smith, who I didn't realize had been really underused until this point. Right. She gets to come into focus. Then at the end, you get Ray Fiennes finally gets to do Voldemort as a real character right. in in the story. And it's magically beautiful for both of them. And again, like, you know, this is the this is the re- renaissance of Maggie Smith. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like this is she's a year into doing Downton Abbey when everyone rediscovered what an extraordinary actress she is, and again I don't know in which order this happens whether they're like, like she's doing she's getting she's popular in Downton Abbey we should give her more to do, or whether it's just organically like we can't leave this franchise without doing something like with Maggie Smith, uh, more central. Than she's been before. Yeah, but, well, I think it's also part and parcel of just you know, that's her role in the book. Yeah, and then and then you know get the end of Alan Rickman's Snape arc. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot to distract me from the things I'm not as keen on, which is why I put this slightly higher. I still think the whole thing is a bad idea, not the whole fraud f- franchise. <laughs> I only think half of that is a bad idea, but the 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 idea of splitting up these movies I think is overall a bad idea. But I prefer this iteration of it because it gives me a, more of what I like about the franchise. Right. I like to think I know something about beer, but nowadays even I get overwhelmed when confronted by the exhaustive selection of craft beers they have at bars, breweries, and even grocery stores. Back in the day you had one, maybe two craft beers to choose from, and if you were confused, you ordered a Guinness. But in beer stations like San Diego, the craft beer options lately are in double, sometimes even triple, digits. So what's a beer drinker to do? You need what I need, the Vegas Beer Guys. Your beer of choice should be a perfect blend of malt and hops. And so a live show about beer needs that same balance. And the Vegas Beer Guys matches beer expert Dan Aker with self-proclaimed beer novice Stephen J. Weiss. The results are eminently drinkable. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. They'll try new beers. They'll tell you about beers. Think of them as your beer sherpas guiding you up a foamy-headed mountain to reach the peak of your pint. God, I need a beer. And we're back. Tom and I are here discussing the last of the Harry Potter films, The Deathly Hallows Part 2. So in our last segment, Tom, we were talking about the walking into rooms scenes, as you call them. And then Which that I is love. Shortly... That's, not a, that's not a criticism. <laughs> my favorite part of the movie. Okay. Is it really? It's, it's your... Favorite part of some of my favorite movies are just people walking into rooms. <laughs> the Maltese Falcon, people walking into rooms, walking into rooms. 
Well, this is shortly great actors. Yeah, like come on. Exactly. I can't believe how little you have to say about these three main actors, or how little you think of them. I've said a lot about them. (laughs) That's why I amended. (laughs) More than I care to. (laughs) All right, that. The talking in room scenes is shortly followed by breaking into Gringotts. Good, bad, don't care. Uh, I'm growing a little tired of the undercover body kidnapping shtick, but it's fine. Okay. Yeah. It, it reinforces you prefer the this, ministry this... to this one? Well, it, it reinforces me. You know, it reinforces to me that this franchise at this point has nothing new to offer. But I, I like. I like the shtick of some point, but now I feel like it's shtick that I'm, you know, tiring of. But it's fine. Fine. I like, I oh, I'll tell you what I do. I do like that we get to see the who's who of little people actors playing okay. all the goblins. That's like, you go on IMDb, you're like, yeah, he's a, he's a, um, Umpa Lumpa, he's a, uh, Star Wars droid. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> and again, it's good that, uh, you can provide employment for such people. Of course. I wish it was outside fa- the realm of fantasy, but if that's what it takes. Well, and so we've we got... We don't want another Time Bandits on our hands. Yeah, oh man, Time Bandits. What a great Well, we do movie. want another Time Bandits, but we don't want, you know, little people actors committing suicide because they can't get work. Thank you, you for know? reminding me. I think I've got a, I've got a new How Dare You Teachable moment for Lady Chu. Because I could tell you for a fact she doesn't know shit about Time Bandits. That's one she should watch. Agreed. <laughs> I don't know what she's going to make of it, though. <laughs> so, we're, you know, by the time we break into Gringotts and we get the cup, which is, of course, a Horcrux. Don't say, of course. <laughs> no, of course. Um, What's going... So this is my note. Can I read you directly from my notes? Yes, please. What's going on with the goblet popcorn and why are they after a cup now? Thought it was about a necklace. <laughs> are you telling me that at this point you didn't get that Voldemort had all... stashed Horcruxes into multiple items and that he was looking for different items from the heads the, from the from the wizards and witches who created the houses of Hogwarts did you not get that <laughs> evidently not no I mean yeah I, I, I'm sure I eventually got that but at the time I was like wait a minute I thought we were after a necklace did we get that necklace was <laughs> there any you know it, it's just it's uh Sometimes this mo- sometimes these movies are difficult to follow if you're not invested in the mythology. Or not because paying I attention. See this... But no, I am paying attention, but uh, you <laughs> are know, you it's, sure? it's it's all MacGuffins to me, so it's like, oh, they've changed what the MacGuffin is. So we've got Great. Still a MacGuffin. Yeah, I mean, basically Voldemort is stashing these things into things that he finds important and he finds, you know, the the ring that blackened Dumbledore's hand and was going to kill him anyway. Which is, again, not a great choice from a plagiarism point of view. That's not a good choice from a plagiarism point of view to have it center around a ring. (laughs) (laughs) Could have thought of something that wasn't like... It's not the one true ring. I mean, give me a break. One of the biggest fantasy series ever, but go on. But at any rate... That's the Ring of Salazar Slytherin. We've got the Sword of Godric Gryffindor. And Helga Hufflepuff is the cup. I understand about a quarter of the words you just used there. (laughs) How about Rowena Ravenclaw? Do they... uh, The genuine question. Go. Is this purposeful alliteration, or is there some kind of wizard thing that means everyone has to have the same letter for both of their names well clearly not harry potter Ron so why Wesley. is there so much alliteration in this world bad writing <laughs> i think that's just because they're the founders 
Who doesn't oh, like alliteration? I don't like excessive alliteration for no reason, but okay. <laughs> excessive. Uh, Harry and We're Ron talking about the... four names. Harry and Ron stripping to the the waist. I noted that. Uh, at least it's the men, but never good to ogle actors that we have were introduced to as kids. I was going to say, so this goes back to your argument about... Yeah, at least it's the men. Former child sure. stars who are now just regular stars. Within the same franchise, I mean, obviously... There's, at some point, you can make the transition, but it's weird to make that transition within the same fictional framework. Uh, and but they grow up. Expect the and expect the audience to kind of like. I don't know. I feel uncomfortable with it. I'm not just a prude. I I feel uncomfortable about that slightly pedophilic aspect of it. That's a leap. Well, I mean, I um, guess maybe because I'm not. I guess maybe because I'm not ogling them when they take off their shirts. But neither am I. I know some people are. <laughs> yeah, but they're all probably teenage girls, right? No. Well, not all, but but every time I'm on a train, it's always like a fifty-year-old man or woman reading oh. it. <laughs> well, now I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just want to rip it out of their hands and give them a copy of Madame Bovary. Yeah, that does sound shitty. Read a fucking real book. Anyway. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And I, I was wrong. It's here when Kieran Hines, as Dumbledore's brother, asks, did he ever mention my name? Yeah, that's, that's what you said last episode, no? Yeah, I thought it was in the previous movie, where he oh, is no. introduced briefly. Well, his eyes, so, right? This this is where it's more Legends of Curly's Gold, this movie. I mean, you keep saying that. I get that they <laughs> look somewhat alike, but... Like, the, the Curly's Gold is far more egregious to me. It's part of the same storytelling trope, which is a and sequel in fact, trope. I remember Billy Crystal, we're going off topic here, you know, stay with no, me. No, I remember Billy. I remember Billy Crystal. I think on the Tonight Show. Uh huh. And he's talking to Carson, or maybe he's. I can't remember when Curly's Gold Leno? came out. Is that ninety three? It must have been Leno by that point. So maybe. Uh, but at any rate, what, was it was it a very good talk show host or a completely <laughs> awful? Talk show host. Well, never I, the I don't remember the talk show host. I just remember Billy Crystal because he was saying, I mean, I don't think even a script had been started on Curly's Gold yet. And he said, I yeah. have this great idea because oh, they said, no. you know, this movie is such a hit. Like, can this, you know, are there, is there going to be another one? And he said, you know, at first I thought leave it alone. But then I actually came up with this idea. Oh, and... No. I really like the idea. So imagine uh, a mound of dirt with a sort of cross over it, and then all of a sudden Jack Palance, you know, rises out of the dirt, covered in dirt, and says, City Slickers. And I like that idea far better than a twin. They thought he was dead mm. and just wasn't. That's basically that Tremors sequel that we pitched. Yeah, right. <laughs> At any rate. So, I just, I, I don't find the fact that Albus Dumbledore has a brother and that he's not mentioned until now is not to me as egregious because they had a falling out. And Dumbledore is actually quite grief-stricken over the falling out which is a very human mm. reason not to talk about it. And really, all the times you see Dumbledore, he is with Harry all the time. It's, a, it's more we... of a conversation he might have with Snape or McGonagall as opposed to mm. with Harry. So I don't find it that egregious that we haven't heard about Aberforth until now. Is D Dumbledore's brother in Fantastic Beasts? No, not yet. 
Okay. I just I, I don't get I don't get it other than to do to have a little bit of Dumbledore left behind. I don't see why he, why you would do that. But anyway, well, I I think it's even though I mean Dumbledore is in this movie, but yeah, in death he only, is. but. <laughs> But I guess, well, let me ask you this as a writer. Is it strange for them to, you know, push character forward for a character that's already dead? It's a little disingenuous. Okay. That's as far as I go. I I think, I think any, yeah, any time you're. I mean, I hesitate to use the words retcon because you're going to jump on it. But at any time you're revisiting motivation of a character and rewriting their personality to some extent is is problematic after they are no longer there because then you, they don't get to play to that development. He can't sort of turn around and Dumbledore is not there to sort of say, it's like, well... Now we know this about me. What does that mean for me? Mm -hmm. uh, we can only do that by implication. So, but there is something it's, at it's play. Rough, but... There's something at play between the choices Harry has to make, reconciled with the man he knew, even being given the new information. Hmm. Like, Harry is confronted with having to choose to continue to trust Dumbledore in the face of his brother saying, he's shitty for this reason and he's shitty for this reason. Did it, was it an easy mission, is it, that he's giving you? What? Why, mm -hmm. why are you doing this? Why did he make you do this? Did you ask yourselves these questions? Mm -hmm. So Harry is confronted with having to keep the connection to the man he knew. Yeah. And also, you know, at one point, I think Voldemort makes some good points as to why Harry might be the villain of this piece. <laughs> it's like, you let all those children die just and suffer just. Hey, those, for, for those children mission? chose to fight. <laughs> they could have left. No, I like I like that. I like that we get it. You know, it's, we, Voldemort is, is just like he is. What's the kind of what's the stock? villain who's just there you know like like uh from inspector gadget what's his name the claw oh man you know who i mean yeah and that's what voldemort's been so far so i'm glad that we're getting his perspective and we see him as a like a not a human thing but uh we get to see him as a fetus at one point. That's freaky. But we get to see him as a we get to see him like as a living, breathing character in the world right. for the first time. And seeing you know him having a voiceover where he's like, mm, Harry might not be all you know. In, in my story, Harry's the villain is a good little yeah you know, mixes things up a little bit. And I think this franchise is fine at doing that. Sure, you know. Very early on, we get the idea. There's light and dark of all of us. Harry is kind of positioned between two different ideas of magic. One wholesome, one uh, immoral. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's kind of acted out here and reasonably successfully. Yeah. I don't mind it. But there's also a constant refrain throughout the movies of being loyal to Dumbledore in the early movies and choosing to believe in Dumbledore in these last, you know, two movies especially. Yeah. Yeah. That's at play and you know, look, like in any movie, the thing I'm always going to care about the most is the depth of humanity within it. Hmm. That's what draws me into a movie. And hmm. it can, you know, it can take many forms, but that's what interests me. And so, I mean, that's why I call all these movies good. And even though this movie's at the bottom of my list, the choices that Harry has to make are in favor of believing in the man, Dumbledore. And that to me is interesting. Does the kind of, 
resurrection aspect compromised that for you? I know a lot of people didn't like it. That he could just rise up from the dead. Like, it was kind of like... What are we talking about? That he sees Dumbledore or the resurrection stone? (laughs) I forgot there was a resurrection stone. (laughs) This is more like Troll 2 than than we're giving credit for. Um... Well, he come. Well, there's a, there's basic, you know, it's a spoiler, but there's a Jesus-like moment where he seems to die and then comes back to life, and it reeks to me of lazy storytelling. Like every time you get that resurrection of someone who's dead in any fantasy story, it just seems to me. But again, it's know, it's that, wrapped that John Snow ra- moment. <laughs> but it's presented to Harry as a choice. Is that when he goes into uh, Back to the Future Part Two? Um, mode with Dumbledore. Is it that point? Yeah. Okay. I just, uh, yeah. I know a lot of people were irritated by that. Because there's a Horcrux inside of him and you have to destroy all the Horcruxes before you can destroy Voldemort. So he has to make that sacrifice. I just, But because it's so selfless, Hmm. he's afforded the opportunity to move on or go back. I just don't think you should use magic to bring people back from the dead, even in fantasy. It's But it's I could argue ju- that he jumping, was it's never... It's just jumping in the shark. It's jumping the shark in another genre, to me. Can't I make the like, argument I don't take that... Game, like... I don't take Game of Thrones seriously after Jon Snow is resurrected. <laughs> and yes, that's another spoiler. We're going to have to have a major... <laughs> we're going to have to have a spoiler alarm right. at the beginning of each of these... But can I make the argument that in practical terms, the curse that Voldemort throws, the Avada Kedavra curse, he throws at Harry. It hits Harry square in the chest. Okay. He's lying on the ground, but the whole time he's lying on the ground, he's not dead. The only thing that's died is the Horcrux inside of him. Okay. And he's imagining (laughs) his conversation because he even asks, is this real or in my head? You've got to look for the Horcrux (laughs) inside yourself. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, okay, yeah. So I'll concede that it's not a full on. I just, I I remember at the time, it's like, is Harry Potter. I never, I never really equated it to being Christ like. A lot of people did. Um, Well, fuck them. (laughs) <laughs> but I, I think, you know, this like it's about how do you end the franchise? Do you kill off the main character? Do you let them live? Right. And this movie kind of splits the difference, or the book kind of splits the difference. And I just think, like, that's lame. <laughs> Have the courage of your convictions, or, or don't. Yeah, I guess for me, it's always... Like I was saying before, I'm always looking towards the depth of humanity, so... Because Harry doesn't know. Harry thinks he's going to die. He makes the choice to die. And so much so. Oh, now maybe I'm just remembering the book. Does he tell. Does he tell anybody else about the snake before he leaves? You're asking the wrong person. Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) It's okay. Uh, But I, I mean, to me. What makes it even more redundant is it seems to me that his, in you know inverted commas, death, inspires, people you know people lesser characters in this to rise up to Voldemort, so he almost doesn't need to come back from the dead. Yeah, because but at the it's... end of the day, he's the only one that can kill Voldemort. Because because he took Draco's wand, because he disarmed Draco, he is actually the master of the Elder Wand, and so the Elder Wand will never destroy him. I feel like you could find a way around that. (laughs) Like just another guy who happens to be called Harry Potter. (laughs) And the prophecy was all about him. (laughs) Could have been Neville. Hear the, hear the two unmentioned. Right, yeah. Well, let's... I mean, I that's what I... You know, I, I've... 
you know, we, there, there's probably more to talk about in between this, but yeah, I mean, we're that that point. Although, as you said, but that's the thing about you know, this it's movie. Only five is, scenes in the movie. Yeah, that's that's basically the movie. And, and one scene is you know an hour and a half long. It's this you know the the battle. Yeah, and that I think that's a, that's kind of a good choice because. You know, what you want from these two movies is to be different in as many ways as possible. They are and that. The first, mo- the first movie is, like, very mobile. The The first part of this is very mobile. Mm-hmm. And this one is confined Stationary. to two or three locations. Right. And I like that. Which I, I think... think works towards its budget, too, because this one was, you know, they spent $25 million fewer dollars. I just can't. I, I just can't comprehend that, that they'd ever say want to save money but i have a hard time of like understand like un, in 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 the in the studio system that you know our current studio system i'm always like but wouldn't you put the money you make towards the next one and that really isn't how things work <laughs> no yeah <laughs> having followed like behind the scenes of Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh it's gosh, like, yeah. They kept the budget super low, even though these movies were like incredible hits. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, but wouldn't you put that movie back, the profits back in? And it's like, no, they never do. Yeah. And so I just can't get my head around like, we got to save. But, some and money here's the on thing too is that when they do do that, it's often to the detriment of movies. I, I you know, a great example are the Matrix movies. Sixty mm. million dollar budget. For that first movie meant the Wachowskis had to be frugal and creative. Being given a blank check for Matrix 2 and 3 did not help that series. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, Stay it's, tuned, it's, it's, ladies and gentlemen, for, <laughs> for for later episodes. But it, it, disting- it certainly distinguishes this. And, of course, in the previous movie, we've barely seen Hogwarts. So we have to kind of catch up with what's going on at Hogwarts right. now, right? Yeah. So that's a that's a big factor in it as well, and you know, almost the sense that this franchise has forgotten that that is its main location because mm-hmm. <laughs> it hasn't been for a few movies. Yeah. <laughs> that it's essentially a school story. Well, and the for fact one that the movie, story ends on school grounds is 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 important. Agreed. If you like podcasts like I do, boy, do I have a treat for you. You need to stay on target and check out the Sounds and Cinema podcast. Listen as your host, sound designer and music creator, Tony Parham, and co-host, musical performer and sound lover, Derek Hansen, D-Rock if you're nasty, and I am, discuss all things sound related to film, television, stage, and theatrical productions. They discuss environmental sounds, bioacoustics, dialogue, the nature of communication through sound. But as an added bonus, they drink beer and try to... Stay on target. Find them wherever you get your podcasts and listen to the pure mania of a man who can charitably be described as Doug, the dog from Up, and another man with a soothing and sultry voice trying to get that man to... Stay on target. That's the Sounds and Cinema Podcast. Tune in and listen to the sounds they are creating just for you. And we're back. We are talking about the 2011 film, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part two. Wait a minute. Tom, did you have a question for me? Wait a minute. Is that a light I see at the end of the tunnel? (laughs) I think it is. We're nearly done. <laughs> it's been hey, there's no one I would rather talk about these movies with than you. Uh, I that's I appreciate sure. that. I I doubt I take that, that as a compliment. I doubt the feeling is reciprocal. But <laughs> no, it actually is. You're exactly <laughs> I, I like you being a member of the loyal opposition. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really would, I would totally throw in with Voldemort's slot. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's a means to an end. Just as a to means to get Harry to an Potter end. out of the world. <laughs> You're gonna make no friends on this oh. podcast, on this series. I'll tell you that much. 
Yeah, I think... Uh... I'd be actually fascinated to find out, you know, how many other uh, Tom Stewart's there are in the world that think like Harry as you Potter do skeptics. in regards... Yeah, right. Well, you know, I, I mean, we can we can save you know we can save uh, overall thoughts for picture sequel, but I will say, uh, from a filmmaking standpoint, I've been interested in enough of these movies, you know, to be to be worth it. And this mm-hmm. is exactly the environment in which I wanted to watch these movies, because, you know, I was I, I have a purpose to watch. Yeah, uh, you never and, would have otherwise. Yeah, and I can just imagine like. You know, I probably would have never made it past Goblet of Fire mm-hmm. in any other circumstances because I'd be like, I don't think there's a better movie than Prisoner of Azkaban after this. Sure. <laughs> like if 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 they didn't double down on that with Goblet of Fire, I can't foresee myself sticking it through. <laughs> and they certainly didn't double down on it. <laughs> oh, that's good. So I think when we last left, we were kind of talking around the big battle mm. of Hogwarts. Yeah. Are, what's your take on that? Because, I mean, this is the biggest scene in the movie. This is the, you know, you have the bedroom scene. You've got the breaking into Gringotts. Then it's the huge battle. And the culmination of that is essentially the death of Snape. And then you've got mm. Harry in the woods. Does Snape I die guess a little... I'll separate Harry in the woods from, you know, Harry, you know, Harry in the woods and then talking to Dumbledore and then you have last fight. So I'll give this movie six scenes. <laughs> Does yeah, so was 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 Snape dying a surprise to you or did you think it was going to happen? No, even that as early? a even as a reader of the books and even I thought he'd be redeemed first before he oh, died. Oh, okay. That's interesting. But he's kind of redeemed I don't think he, I, I don't know if I gave that a conscious thought when I started at book seven. But finishing book six, I had a very strong sense that, that killing Dumbledore was with purpose. Hmm. And that, A, that he would die. Yeah. And... At Voldemort's hands, I the, the I guess the thing I wondered about was would he reveal himself to Voldemort or not, and that didn't happen. That's true. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that would have been it, that would have been a nice moment. I'm in two minds about it because, you know, from my perspective, who you know. I don't need to see him redeemed and for it, it, him to reveal that he was on their side all along because I know that's what's going on. But I would have liked to have seen, I guess the reason that might have interested me is just because of the sheer vanity of Voldemort. Yeah. Feeling like he knows anything and everything. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, but it, it it so it's it's a nice it's all it's 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 an unexpected twist for him to sort of die before all that happens, and then all that happens, you know, in the story without him being there, and he does so. It's like, well, is you know, and my thought was, well, isn't he gonna, isn't he set up to save them? Uh, but of course he. Say he was saving them from the beginning. Yeah. So it kind of doesn't matter. Well, going back to the last film, did you... Did you think it would be him that returned the sword of Gryffindor to them? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, that said, I thought it was... He was set up for a last minute, I've been a double agent all along kind of moment. And so, you know, I don't need that because I know... Uh, it's not great that they do it in flashback, but there's a lot of flashback packages in, in in this movie. Right, when he's dropping his memories into the pensieve. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, and I, I guess I was really curious what you would think about that 
because I didn't imagine that you would love flashbacks. And I guess my my question to you is. Do you find any value in it? Because is his love for Lily, was it plainly evident enough that you don't need those flashback those flashbacks? No, I think um And if not, what's the remedy other than the flashbacks? <sighs> well, cuz he does so... like his last words are you have your mother's eyes. Well, there's Is that a diff- almost enough right there? Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you never need a flashback, really. You can always write around it. But I didn't mind it. I like that there was different levels of flashback. We had the going, you know, phys- physically going into the past as ghosts. Also, mm-hmm. you know, the usual suspect style. You're re-showing everything, but now you know it in a different light. So it all has a different meaning. Uh, I mean, it's not as good a plot as the usual suspects where you go, oh, wow, because mm-hmm. like right. from the, mo- you know, certainly from the moment that he goes shush to Harry, Snape goes shush to Harry. I'm like, he's on his side. Doesn't matter what he says either way. Right. The movie's telling me that. And the it, yeah, it, it's so it serves a purpose well, and but, the thing with but you're, absolute, but you're absolutely is right it... less is more this movie never needed to be made <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what you're arguing but that's no. the natural extension of 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 that argument is like and I don't know that this needs to be said but like uh, but it just also occurred to me that within uh usual suspects I think part of the reason the the flashbacks work are, are a because of what you just said but also because that's uh modern day kind of noir yeah and it just works better for that style of film yeah and it's you know it's but i mean we are a dumbledore is an unreliable and it's narrator. quick like those, those memories are those flashbacks are happening like this whereas there are extended scenes of snape as a teenage boy talking with lily yeah and the the metal ball full of cameos as well mm-hmm we have a little, you know, a, a little, uh, it's like an immemorium. <laughs> <laughs> the metal ball of cameos. Uh, and then we have the, well, the, the Voldemort blood fetus, which, I mean, I said that the snake was the last stand of body horror in the franchise, but it's really this. It looks amazing. Wait, say it again. The Voldemort blood fetus. Oh, right. Little, little uh, baby alien. Yeah. Ray Fiennes. That's hard to look at, right? Didn't see that coming. Especially in that really clinical looking flashback world that they were in. The hospital. Yes. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's a train station, it looks like a hospital. Yeah. Um. And, you know, I guess they have fun kind of blowing up the school. Mm-hmm. You know, this sort of sense that it's all over now. <laughs> We've seen everything <laughs> one last time. Uh, now we can blow up, you know, Psycho for the beginning style. We can blow up the Bates Motel. <laughs> we can right. blow up Hogwarts. Well. Uh, although I guess it must be rebuilt at some point. Oh, sure. I mean, they all know magic. Won't take time at all. They could just like Superman's uh, rebuilding, rebuilding the Great Wall of China, the Great Wall of China. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. With hopefully better effects. I do also like I like in this movie when they put that protective charm shield over the school Mm. and the sort of the Death Eaters throwing their spells into it and cracking the dome and all of that Mm. visually I think looks really cool and I you know a lot of I actually like a lot of the character choices here that you know the choice of who defeats who Uh, oh yeah yeah Mrs. Mrs. Weasley taking out uh, Bellatrix Bride of Burton um (laughs) who I mean Helena Monocata annoys me generally but that character what 
I I was ready for. I know I know it would have fucked things up for Harry if he killed her in the wheat field in whatever movie it was two movies ago. <laughs> but I wish he had because she is so annoying. Um, yeah, I let, it was like it was annoying like, okay. as an actor or a character. Potentially both, mainly as a character. Um, she's so deliciously evil. Come on. Uh, but I, you know, that was I was like, oh, I didn't see Mrs. Weasley, you know, being the. As an action heroine, oh yeah, I coming. Love it. That's Get nice. Away from her, and you then bitch. Neville, and then Neville. Stand, you know, I'm like, it's like this. This of all the kid actors, he's the Neville's one that... transformation through these movies is just fucking fantastic. Of the of the of the students, he's the one who's acting I have most enjoyed. Yeah, and for him to get his moment. That's a very good call. And I guess this movie makes quite good calls about who you want to see more of that you haven't seen enough of. Oh, okay, yeah. John Hurt, Warwick Davis, Neville, Mrs. Weasley. <laughs> does it does the movie have emotional impact for you at the at the rapid fire pace it's going when you find out? That, you know, Lupin is dead and a Weasley twin is dead. and mm, It's an interesting question. Do you think that's rushed? Well, I just, you know, this movie, one, once we start that battle. Yeah. It's I think that's fine in a battle context. Hard to you, catch your fucking breath, right? You know there's going to be defeat on both sides. There are good people on both sides, as we know. <laughs> Find people on both sides. Find people on both sides. Given the tenor of of the last couple days, holy shit! <laughs> I was gonna say let's narrow it down for people, but because conceivably when this comes out, there will be no difference. Right? <laughs> you could say that about any couple of days in twenty twenty one. Oh shit. Are we but, at the time so, but I mean, did, did it register for you? Like you see Lupin's dead body next to his wife and think, oh, no, that makes me sad. Or are you yeah, thinking, I mean... get to the end, get to the end. I'm done with this whole series. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the podcast or the movie? Um, <laughs> no, yeah, I. It's, you make me seem like such a heartless fuck. You are. <laughs> That's yeah, what I'm, I'm sad David Thewlis dies. Huh? Yeah, I'm sad David Thewlis dies. Okay. I mean, yeah, sure. Not to mention Nymphadora, his wife. Their their son's going to grow up an orphan. Well, it worked okay for Harry. <laughs> <laughs> worked out fine for him. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's, it's, it's very bloody, very dark, and... It's, uh, I, I, I mean, I was just, you know, I was, I was enjoying a lot of, I think, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's been so back and forth with so many characters that it's hard to keep so many in your mind at one point. I guess the books help foreground them and their importance, but it's hard, you know. I remember Lupin being important. But well, I that's why I was curious as a, as a yeah. person, like, you know, as a non-reader of the books. I right. almost just said non-reader and left it at that. But <laughs> as previously stated, hey, I've got a good analogy. A I've books. got a good analogy for you that proves that I've read a book. <laughs> Go. This multi-part film thing is like, you know, if in 1955 when they made East of Eden, they tried to adapt the whole fucking book. But no, they made they made the sensible call to cut out half of it and focus on the interesting part of the book that would appeal to the audience of the time. There you go. So there you go. I've read a book. <laughs> but I was curious and a long book of that. Yeah. I was curious as you know, as a non reader of the books, yeah. if you feel the emotional weight of the well, loss of these characters. It's hard with such or a Or if it's huge... hard with such a Huge cast. Yeah. I mean, it reminded me of... I don't know if you've seen any of the Honest trailers. Uh, they're, they're a fabulous kind of parody 
um, website who make uh, on it like what they call honest version, honest trailers for movies. You know, not what you would want yeah, to tell an right, audience, right, but right, what right, actually right. happens in them. And their one for Toy Story Four, they 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 allude to the fact that this movie casts some of the best actors you've ever seen in roles where they only say the names Woody and Buzz. <laughs> and I had that feeling here, especially when Kelly McDonald turns up as Ravenclaw and doesn't right. do very much. I'm like. There's so many, you know, you've cast so many great actors in so many roles. They literally only have, physically only have time to say one or two lines. Right. And it's like, that... You sort of, you lament that? I mean, you just like, I mean, it just, it, it's kind of a little bit thankless for them. And, you know, that's why I use the Toy Story 4 example. Um, but, you know, it's like... It's just such a it's such a huge canvas of characters to kind of cope with. Right. And it's not it's harder to as you know as we know like adapting. But again that goes back to my argument of why I like the previous movie so much is because you strip it of all that and then you just focus on the three yeah. main characters. Yeah, I mean, I would f I would feel exactly the same if if my If you liked those actors. <laughs> if if you know if 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 my pleasure in this movie wasn't tied up with, you know, what are essentially cameos from amazing actors. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's what I want to see as much of as possible. It's I feel bad for them sometimes. So I don't think they're getting the full uh, impact of what they could be doing. Of what they could, right. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, we, we, we come up with this, you know, you... You when adapting works like June for the screen, you know it's like you could you have to you have to make the choice to cut certain characters out, ignore certain subplots. These movies have sort of chosen both to do that and not to do that, mm -hmm. which makes it very difficult as someone who is not in on the mythology to to keep all of that in focus at one time. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you do what I've been doing, which is to cling to certain things, like generically, tonally, uh, narratively, that, that, that really jump out to you as successful or unsuccessful. Well, of course, in any movie that anybody sees, you're going to get out of it what you bring to it. Well, yes and no, but I came into this with an open mind. Um, but yeah, but what I'm what I'm saying is, you're you like you went into it without any love for Harry Potter. You are in fact a British man. Steady so, on now. And so the thing that you clung to in the movies are, you know, ha had to do with all these great British actors who are just, you know, working their asses off, doing great work, but. I'm As not the much. Movies get fuller; those roles get smaller, and you know, you know what? I don't, I don't think of myself as an anglophile. I mean, yeah, there's a certain comfort associated with British actors, but okay. in general, in general, I prefer non-British actors. Ah, interesting. I just think that these are some of the best actors in the world, right? You know, regardless and, of of regardless their of, nationality, yeah, like like <laughs> their place know, of birth. Like, uh, you know, I don't like Judy Dench. I, you know, I couldn't care less about Ian McKellen. It's like I'm weird about some British actors that people are really cultish about. So I'd, it's not necessarily... I just feel like... I feel like it's all about the gap, I think, between what the main cast are doing and what the supporting cast are doing. And I'm always going to gravitate towards that supporting cast because they are... Th their competency is just so far in advance and what they're able to do with that material is so far in advance of what the main cast are able to do. All right. That's it. But okay. I'm not, I'm, and you know, th these, these kind of British, this part of British culture that Harry Potter represents is obviously something that I'm, uh, that I'm weary of. Uh, it doesn't read to me at all. Mm. 
So. Can we talk about the time jump? Go ahead. What do you th- what do you th- I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I never th- I think it's never a good idea. It works far better in books than it does in movies. Well, that's the thing is that I know that it's going to be there because it's in the book, right? So I walk into the movie expecting to see it. So for me, it's what form does it take? Mm. Because it can go one of two ways. You can have the actors who have already been playing these roles and try to age them up. You could cast new actors. That would have been the better choice for me. And what does that do? You know, so that would have been the best choice for you. Not just because I don't like these actors, but because they, no fault of their own, but they don't convince as people who are 19 years older. To me. Yeah, I mean, I... uh... I understand. Considering the choice they made, though, I was actually, I don't know if impressed is the right word, but. The function of it is fine. Yeah, I, you know, I thought they looked, I thought it looked fine. And the it's only nice thing really circle. graining against the fact that it's, you know, so many years later is the fact that you know for a fact that they're not that old. You know? Right. But. It's also hard to cast actors who would just be in that one scene. Right. I mean, talk about thankless. Yeah, exactly. And I Unless was thinking, you made it I account- was thinking about it in terms of filming it. Like, if you were going to film this movie, wouldn't you probably save that scene for last so that the cast kind of has this moment of. And that's a wrap on Harry Potter. And. I thought you meant that you would, you should, I, I, I understand what you mean now, but when you started saying that, I thought you meant they should boyhood it. Like, (laughs) stop filming this. (laughs) Wait 12, wait 19 years. Yeah, right. (laughs) And then release the movie. Oh, that'd be funny if they made them, made, made fans wait for a couple decades. I mean, there is still the possibility that that they could go back, refilm it, and then slip it in as a, right. as a special edition. That's funny, but you know, so for me, like from a filming standpoint, you want you want the cast who has been working on these movies for ten fucking years to be able to have that moment together, yeah. as opposed to hiring new actors and. Oh, okay. And the last thing they filmed is whatever the last thing they filmed was. Might have been in the middle of the movie kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, you you wouldn't have... The audience wouldn't have the connection to to the characters unless... Unless, I guess, the the only way you'd get around that is that you make them the most famous people that have been in the movie thus far. Mm -hmm. Like it was... I'm sure there are better names, but like Tom Cruise or something. (laughs) Right. Grown up Harry Potter is Tom Cruise, um, you know what I mean? It's it's like if you if you had like some of the most famous people in the world as the grown up versions of the characters, I think people would just about accept it as an as a nice payoff. But uh, in general, I'm an I'm gonna say you're probably right overall that. Um, the audience wouldn't accept it. Right. I, I just think there, you know, you put yourself into an untenable situation at that point. And I like, I like that we go full circle and, you know, they're taking their kids to, to Hogwarts. Right. So yeah, what, that was my next why question. Why they want to fucking send them back to that hell hole. I don't know, but <laughs> Jesus Christ. Talk about repeating the mistakes of history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know and then and then Draco is forgiven but we don't really know how that happened. Right. So is that what the play picks up on or no? No, no. Okay. The play is like an older Harry Potter. I just Potter, assumed right? your pitch a sequel would take care of that. Maybe, maybe not. 
All right, we'll find out. Uh, Anything else? I don't want to end on a downer. However. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was just I was just like after all this I was like, you know, you can sort of convince yourself that maybe you're wrong about how good or bad this trio of actors are. I thought even the little kid who played his son was a better actor than Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> get, get the fuck. Jesus Christ. You have got it in for these three kids. <sighs> I didn't like thinking that, but I, I did I did think that. Um, no, I yeah, I don't I don't oh yeah. <laughs> this is going back a well not much actually, but we see Jim Broadbent again briefly. Mm -hmm. And there's he's just he's muttering something as as the camera kind of pans across him. And I thought I can't remember exactly what he said, but it's priceless. I think he's explaining in his own way what's ha what just happened. And it's so lovely. And I'm so <laughs> glad we... Again, I think this movie is all about, like, who do we want to see Yeah. again one last time? How do we want to see them? And in, that, in those terms, it's a success. Does that mean the movie should exist? No, absolutely not. <laughs> you could definitely do this story in one movie if you're looking at it in a macro sense um but you 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 are also right and something that i'm completely oblivious to which is that the fans would riot right if you didn't include as many details as possible like this yeah and this is you know this this is part of if you think of a I mean, this is what eight eight movies overall, or nine movies. You mean including How many beasts? No, just the Harry Potters. Nine well, movies, eight. eight eight movies. Um, so it you can almost think about it like a TV series, and mm -hmm. you know when I think about, you know, when you're watching a you're watching a like a TV series, you're interested in how it wraps up, but your favorite episodes are probably not the finale in well, general. Not, yeah. Usually they fuck that up, but usually they fuck it up. Usually it's more about wrapping up the story and you don't get a very satisfying overall episode and you gravitate, gravitate towards episodes that stand alone as a, as an individual work of art. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of this series too. And I don't think that's anything about the series it's just how we, like, you know, Prisoner of Azkaban for me and Chamber of Secrets and Order of the Phoenix. Those are my favorite episodes in this series. Uh, but at some level, I know that they have to work out this series, how they're going to work it out. Sure. Right. And that that's not going to be my favorite iteration of it. But that's that's about ongoing storytelling and how you deal with that. Right, right, right. That's as positive as I can be at this point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ladies it's and gentlemen. It's not their fault. Go ahead and send your hate mail for Tom <laughs> to Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> Find us on Twitter. Although ironically, ironically, even though I'm called oh, Tom Stewart. Tom. Ironically, even though I'm called Tom Stewart, my email is in fact uh, Michael Shantz at Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> Just a weird quirk of my email that means it all goes to Mike. <laughs> Find uh, you can go ahead and send an email, but send it to everything sequel at gmail dot com. And yeah, let not my personal account, please. Just let Tom have it. All right, for Tom Stewart from Lonesome Whistle Productions, I am Michael Schatz from the How Dare You Awards. We are going to see you.